Okay, uh, our topic today is endometrial cancer. Now you see here, again, you see here, Okay, endometrial cancer. Endometrial carcinoma is the most common malignancy of the female genital tract, accounting for almost one half of all gynecological cancers. Of course, you must understand, my friends, that the first uh, most important kind of gynecological cancer is, of course, breast cancer. Now we are speaking about affection of genital tract including uh, fallopian tubes, ovaries, uh, endometrium, uh, cervix, and vagina. Among of these malignancies, it's a one half of all gynecological cancers. Endometrial carcinoma most often occurs in women in the sixth and the seventh decades of life at an average age of 60 years. 75% of cases occur in women elder than 50 years of age. Endometrial cancer can be classified into two distinct groups, type 1 and the type 2, based on histology, which differs in molecular, clinical, and the histopathological profiles. Type 1 is estrogen-dependent, endometrioid, no aggressive and carries good prognosis. Type 2 is non-estrogen-dependent, non-endometrioid, more aggressive and carries poor prognosis. Although type 2 cancers contribute only about 10% of endometrial carcinoma incidence, they present at advanced age and cause approximately 50% recurrency and death with a low 5-year overall survival rate. Type 2 endometrial carcinoma are also characterized by genetic alteration in P53, human epidermal growth factor 2 nu, P16, and the E. catherin. I want to remind you the structure of endometrium. It consists of Functional zone, layer closest to the cavity, contains majority of glands, undergoes changes with monthly cycle. Yesterday we have discussed the typical changes in endometrium within the menstrual cycle, within endometrial cycle. After menstruation, there is regeneration, proliferation, and the secretion. There are normal changes in endometrium in physiological menstrual endometrial cycle. Basal zone, lay it just under myometrium, attaches functional layer to myometrial tissue, has terminal ends of glands, remains constant within menstrual cycle. What predisposition, what benign pathologies of endometrium could be in the uterus? Polyps, clinically entity referring a tumor attached by a pedicle. There are two types of polyps, mucose and fibroid. What are they? There are projection of endometrium to the endometrial cavity with vessels, arterial and veins. There is a macroscopical picture of polyp. Ultrasound investigation and hysteroscopy are the best ways 
of correct of uh, detection of all types of hyperplasia in endometrium diffuse and the local i mean polyps at the right side of picture you see the typical presentation of polyp which is possible to detect by hysteroscopy endometrial hyperplasia involves the proliferation of endometrial glands that results in a greater than normal gland to stroma ratio endometrial hyperplasia results from continuous estrogen stimulation that is unopposed by progesterone remember my friends how we yesterday discussed the hrt tr therapy without progestin and the possibility of unopposed stimulation of endometrium and formation of proliferation and even hyperplasia now you see this result of unopposed stimulation of endometrium by estrogens hysteroscopy again in simple hyperplasia the endometrium is unevenly thickened has a folded structure the base of the fold is wide the apex is thin with uneven edges the shade of the folds varies from pale pink to bright red ultrasound features in hyperplasia thicken it he hyper echogenic and the metrium with irregular outline increased vascularity with low vascular resistance intrauterine fluid there are typical findings features ultrasound features in patients with endometrial hyperplasia how do we classify hyperplasia simple hyperplasia means that there is increased number of glands but regular glandular architecture complex hyperplasia crowded irregular glands simple hyperplasia with atypia it's a principal question the presence of atypia simple hyperplasia with presence of cytologic atypia prominent nucleoli and nuclear pleomorphism complex hyperplasia with atypia complex hyperplasia with cytologic atypia at this picture you see macroscopical presentation of hyperplasia thickened endometrium plicated endometrium and of course presence of fluid inside the uterine cavity at this picture there is a microscopical presentation of complex hyperplasia without atypia at this picture there is a complex hyperplasia already with atypia atypia describes the appearance of the individual glandular cells increased nuclear cytoplasmic ratio similar to cin in cervical pathologies risk of malignization of hyperplasia depends on the type of benign hyperplasia or presence of atypia in patients with simple cystic hyperplasia without atypia progression to cancer could be in only one percent of patients in complex typical hyperplasia the progression to cancer could be in 3% of cases. Contrary 
In a typical hyperplasia, complex cystic atypical hyperplasia may transform to malignant condition in 8% of cases. And in complex adenomatose with atypia, the progression could be in 29% of patients. Signs and symptoms of hyperplasia. The most common sign of hyperplasia is abnormal uterine bleeding. They could be such types as bleeding during the menstrual period that is heavier or last longer than usual. It's of course individual and objective sign. It's necessary to confirm it by different measures. For example, by the detection of post-hemorrhage anemia, which could be in these patients, especially if the process is uh, prolonged. Of course, you must pay attention for any bleeding after menopause. We use such term as postmenopausal bleedings because mainly this situation is connected with malignancy or benign hyperplasia of endometrium. Don't ignore these situations. Endometrial hyperplasia in the past was commonly diagnosed on endometrial biopsies of women investigated for infertility. However, these are not routinely performed and it is now most commonly diagnosed in women over 40 years old with irregular menstruation or in those with postmenopausal bleeding. And of course, most accurate method of diagnosis of hyperplasia now is transvaginal ultrasonography, which is non-invasive and very effective for the detection of hyperplastic processes of endometrium. Management of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia depends on the age of patient, histology, symptoms, and desire for retaining fertility. Exclude treatable causes of unopposed estrogens, my friends. It's easy to do. Ask the patient about estrogen only HRT, for example. Estrogen secreting tumor, for example, granulosa cell tumor of ovary. It's a typical situation because this type of benign tumor don't demonst does not demonstrate any other symptoms because you know already that estrogen secreting tumors does not characterize by big size, presence of ascites, discomfort, or another signs and symptoms. One possible symptom could be the presence of atypical bleeding, intramenstrual bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding due to the abnormal proliferation and the formation of hyperplasia of endometrium. And of course, my friends, in all these patients, you will not think about estrogen secreting tumor. You will suspect endometrial pathology. And of course, the management of this patient is typical. Ultrasound investigation, finding of endometrial hyperplasia, endometrial biopsy or curatage, and detection of benign endometrial hyperplasia. In all these cases, you must ask yourselves what is the cause of hyperplasia in patients without estrogen HRT, for example. And the possible situation could be estrogen secreting of secreting ovarian tumor. If there is no result of uh, influence of estrogen secreting tumor, you can use progestogens for the correction of this pathology. Continuous oral progestogens daily for three to six months. Five milligram nor testosterone, nor uh, premenopausal women, 10 milligram 
medroxyprogesterone acetate perimenopausal women, 20 mg medroxyprogesterone acetate in postmenopausal women. I want to underline, my friends, without estrogen secreting tumors, because in patients with tumors of ovary, one way of correction is surgical, my friends. Of course, I believe you understand it. Then, next possibility of correction of endometrial hyperplasia in patients with employment of HRT or without HRT, but no necessity to operate them, is employment of levonorgestrel intrauterine device. You already know the benefits of this kind of treatment. Only local, only topical influences actions of progestin without systemic side effects and the effective correction of uh, hyperplasia by local progestin therapy. Management of atypical endometrial hyperplasia. 46% of women with atypical hyperplasia will have a concurrent adenocarcinoma and if not concurrent there is a very high risk the woman will develop adenocarcinoma you already know 29 percent of patients may demonstrate that malignant transformation of atypical endometrial hyperplasia to adenocarcinoma Counsel about high risk of developing endometrial cancer carcinoma is your first task in conversation with the patient. Unless fertility is desired, recommended abdominal, transabdominal hysterectomy plus bilateral salpinga ophorectomy if the patient is uh, elder than 45 years. If conservative treatment, then treat with high doses of progestogens. For example, medroxyprogesterone acetate, 100 mg daily. Very responsible situation because of despite of this treatment, the transformation of atypical hyperplasia to endometrial cancer could be. Rebiopsy is needed every three to six months until progression or regression and continue with long-term surveillance. Intrauterine system arena often used for maintenance treatment if not trying to conceive. Strongly consider hysterectomy if fertility not required, my friends. Incidence of endometrial cancer. Worldwide difference in prevalence reflect difference in risk factors. You see the difference of incidence of endometrial carcinoma in North America and Africa. And incidence is rising with increasingly Western lifestyle. What does it mean, my friends, Western lifestyle? Anybody, please write your answers in chat. How do you understand? Western life's lifestyle, which is important for the genesis of endometrial carcinoma. Your ideas, please. Anybody, please write. Smoking, drinking, alcohol, abuse, okay, diet, diet, estrogen employment, fatty diet, yes. Yes, everything, my friends, in some smoking, yes. Fatty diet first, my friends, and uh, lifestyle. Lifestyle is a general, common, a general term. Uh, unhealthy foods, yes, unhealthy foods. Uh, fatty diet, yes, that's right. The um, fatty diet, the fast food in combination with uh, smoking, of course, and my friends, widespread in uh, employment of uh, estrogen-containing drugs. HRT, first of all, my friends, it's uh, there are as a sum a risk factors for the formation of um, endometrial carcinoma. That's right, good for you. Estrogen dependent endometrial cancer, type one. 
and the metrioid adenocarcinoma of the uterine corpus is a primary and the metrial adenocarcinoma characterized by the presence of malignant glandular epithelial cells resembling endometrial cells. These neoplasms are influenced by estrogen levels in body. Endometrioid adenocarcinoma is the most common type of endometrial carcinoma. From 60 to 80% of all cases of endometrial cancer. It occurs usually in a relatively young perimenopausal women with a history of unopposed estrogen exposure, usually preceded by endometrial diffuse or local hyperplasia, epithelial polyps. Risk factors of type 1 endometrial cancer. First, history of unopposed estrogen exposure. For example, it could be use of estrogen replacement therapy without opposing progesterone. Use of tamoxifen during treatment of breast cancer. My friends, tamoxifen is very interesting drug because it has biopotential and may demonstrate anti-estrogen activity in breast tissue and weak estrogen activity in endometrial tissue. And it's a typical complication of treatment by tamoxifen of patients with breast cancer. Obesity. Obesity, I believe you know and remember, is characterized by, by peripheral conversion of androgens from adrenals or ovaries to estrone and estradiol in adipocytes. And uh, these additional amounts of estrogens may induce the formation of hyperplasia and even endometrial carcinoma. Late menopause and early menarche. I believe you understand that the prolonged period of menstruating may lead to the prolonged stimulation of endometrium by estrogens, especially in patients with chronic anovulation. You see the fourth risk factor for endometrial cancer. It's typical for polycystic ovarian syndrome, my friends. Remember, what are typical features of PCOS? Hirsutism due to hyperandrogenemia, infertility, irregular menstruation, uh, sometimes amenorrhea, as a result of abnormal balance in estrogens, progesterone, and the gonadotropins, of course. And anovulation is typical for them. In patients with lack of progesterone in anovulatory cycles, endometrium is under unopposed stimulation by ovarian estrogens. And as a result, these patients have high risk of formation of hyperplasia and finally endometrial cancer. Fifth risk factor, newly parity. You know, my friends, that pregnancy is associated with high progesterone levels. And in para patients, they have the long periods of prevalence of progesterone in their body. And as a result, it's a method of prophylaxis of endometrial hyperplasia. Excessive and the genus estrogen, my friends, we have discussed it already today. Granulosa cells tumor of ovary, excessive ovarian cortical function. It's not a tumor, it's a dysfunctional process. But both these situations lead to the endometrial hyperplasia and finally adenocarcinoma. Diabetes, especially diabetes type 2 because of risk of obesity and chronic anovulation is very 
high in these patients. You know the cancer syndrome, my friends, when the patient have combination of hypertension, diabetes, and obesity as a result of metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a risk factor for endometrial cancer. Of course, it's very important the family predisposition for the cancer. Very important is personal history of breast cancer, shared lifestyle risk factors, and tamoxifen usage. Genetic predisposition of type 1 endometrial cancer. HNPCC Lynch 2 syndrome with high risk of colorectal, endometrial, and ovarian tumors. 40 to 60 percent lifetime risk of endometrial cancer. Inherited as autosomal dominant condition. Inherited mutation in one copy of mismatch repair gene. What about protective factors for endometrial carcinoma? First of all, parity, high progesterone doses, levels in pregnancy. Also, employment of combined oral contraceptive pills, 50% decrease with up to four years of use, up to 72% with 12 or more years as a result of prolonged progesterone effect. Subtypes of hormone-dependent endometrial cancer. Among of adenocarcinoma, they could be villaglandular papillary carcinoma, secretory ciliated cell adenocarcinoma with squamous differentiation, mucinous carcinoma. At this picture, you see macroscopical presentation of endometrial cancer. You see cauliflower-like structures, which are typical mostly for cervical cancer, but they could be in endometrial cancer too. You see that's a very high amount of these intrauterine masses. And you can imagine that these patients probably ignored this situation because of this uh, kind of cancer is normally accompanied by excessive bleeding. It's not necessary to pay attention for every episode of postmenopausal or excessive bleeding in reproductive age women because of the cause of this bleeding could be endometrial carcinoma. Another presentations of endometrial cancer. It looks like benign hyperplasia and only histological investigation will confirm what is it, benign hyperplasia or endometrial cancer. The visual presentation of this kind of cancer is not so dangerous than in a previous picture. You see the difference between them. Necrotic tissue, cauliflower structures, and hyperplasia in this kind of uh, endometrial carcinoma. Polypoid structures in endometrial cancer in another picture of endometrial cancer. Microscopical presentation of endometrial cancer is at this picture. Invasion of endometrial cancer to myometrium is visible here. You see the structures of endometrial cancer with invasion into the myometrial wall. Presentations of villaglandular papillary adenocarcinoma. It's characterized by a papillary architecture with delicate fibrovascular stocks lined by cuboidal two columnar cells with minimal cellular stratification and mild nuclear pleomorphism. Secretary carcinoma is characterized by prominent cytoplasmic vacuolis and 
interluminal secretion. You see it. The neoplasm is usually low grade. Ciliated cell carcinoma is exceedingly rare, is well differentiated, and consists of glands line predominantly by ciliated cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Mucinous carcinoma. Mucinous carcinoma is generally well differentiated and is characterized by columnar cells with basally located nuclei and mucin rich cytoplasm. Key points Type 1 tumor, adenocarcinoma, are influenced by endocrine modulation, estrogen unopposed by progesterone. Type 1 carcinoma is related to hyperestrogenism by association with endometrial hyperplasia. Frequent expression of estrogen and progesterone receptors in the younger age. It's very important points, my friends, because of uh, on the basis of this information, this knowledge, you may include a special treatment in management, into the management of this kind of adenocarcinoma. Answer, please, my friends, anybody. What can you include into the management of type 1 adenocarcinoma, additionally to other uh, therapeutical procedures and the surgery? What possibility have we got in this group of patients? Please write, anybody. Progesterone, anything else? Progestins, good. Good for your activity, for your attention. Progesterone, yes, my friends. Of course, progesterone and progestin. Progestins, of course, not pure progesterone. Progestins, of course, because of sensitivity for estrogens and progesterone is typical for this kind of endometrial cancer. Excellent for you. Thank you. Sometimes uh, I hear such bad mistakes of uh, students when uh, they apply to use estrogens, my friends, in treatment of endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Don't do this mistake. Don't confuse, please. Estrogens will only stimulate the process. Progesterone, pure progesterone, and progestins only. Okay, my friends, these tumors are better differentiated with mild to moderate nuclear pleomorphism and show less myometrial, myometrial invasion and low potential for lymphatic spread. Molecular genetic profile with type 1 shows defects in. DNA mismatch repair and mutations in ptan, cross, and beta catenin. At this picture, you see the typical pathway of formation of type 1 adenocarcinoma from normal endometrium due to imbalance in proliferation and apoptosis in situation of or anovulation, formation of hyperplasia. A uh, mutation of uh, genes, and uh, according to the long period of stimulation, formation of atypical hyperplasia, and then endometrial adenocarcinoma, initially grade one, then grade three. Under the influence of uh, gene mutations, also an imbalance of estrogens and progesterone. Ways of spread. Direct extraction is typical to the cervix downwards or to myometrium. Sometimes vagina is also involved secondary to the process. Then, lymphatic pelvis, pelvic and paraiotic lymph nodes. Transubal, transubal spread, fallopian tubes and ovaries, ovaries could be involved into the process. Hematogenous, distant, of course, typically distant metastasis to the liver, lungs, and the bones. Clinical manifestation. It's typical for all types of hyperplasia, 
from simple benign hyperplasia to endometrial ca cancer, both types, type, type 1, type 2. Abnormal vaginal bleeding, first of all, postmenopausal bleeding. First and early finding and commonly leads to development of anemia, my friends. I already spoke about it. Confirm the presence. Just a moment. Uh, confirm the presence of uh, anemia as a result of uh, hemorrhage. Moment. Statistically, one in ten women with postmenopausal bleeding will have endometrial cancer or atypical hyperplasia. Next sign, next symptom of endometrial cancer. Vaginal discharge, my friends, lymphorrhea or purulent discharge could be. Uh, vaginal discharge and the pyometra may occur instead of bleeding have a high index of suspicion in postmenopausal women with pervaginal vaginal discharge. 50% of postmenopausal women with pyometra have underlying carcinoma my friends pay attention for watery discharge in postmenopausal patients investigate them and the possible finding is endometrial carcinoma also my friends in advanced stages of cancer they could be pelvic pain or pressure weight loss dyspareunia of course, in case of involvement of vagina, cervix into the process. Weight loss is a component of paraneoplastic syndrome. It could be nausea, vomiting also. Uh, pay attention for these symptoms of paraneoplastic syndrome, which is, of course, nonspecific. Ultrasound investigation for the diagnosis of uh, endometrial carcinoma. First of all, such non-invasive procedure as transvaginal ultrasound is very effective and accurate in postmenopausal women. Normal endometrium is less than 4 millimeters. Reproductive age, depending on the phase of menstrual cycle. In proliferative phase, from 4 to 9 millimeters. Secretory phase, from 9 to 12 millimeters transvaginal ultrasound investigation if it demonstrates a less than four millimeters and the natural thickness echo it's a very low risk of endometrial pathology in postmenopausal women no requirement for endometrial sampling Gynecological examination, which also is non-specific. What is possible to find by gynecological in the examination? Only in advanced stages of process, you can find enlargement of uterus, uh, its abnormal mobility, and the involvement of cervix, vagina, or ovaries into the process if they are palpated in the block with uterus. Ultrasound investigation also can find polyps or thickened hyperplastic endometrium. Office endometrial as aspiration. Only for the screening of this process, because the effectiveness of uh, microscopical investigation of aspirate from this uh, procedure is not uh, very accurate. But for the first measure, it's possible to do. Next measure is hysteroscopy with endometrial biopsy under the visual control. Of course, it's a very good procedure. Also, don't forget about the fractional dilation and the curettage. When we uh, curate uh, separately cervical canal and endometrial cavity, I believe you remember the task of this division is uh, to rule out the uh, contamination of uh, cervical canal by endometrial cells. Pap smear, chest X-ray, computer tomography, MRI, check to extend, uh, check extent of the disease in advanced stages, of course, my friends. 
only in these patients in situation of involvement of vagina or cervix or distant organs into the process these procedures are effective histopathology finding in women with postmenopausal bleeding my friends don't forget that not only endometrial carcinoma could be in this patient for example atrophy about 50 percent of patients proliferation or secretory changes about five percent benign polyps nine percent hyperplasia no atypia 27 percent of patients atypical hyperplasia adenocarcinoma non-diagnostic and other disorders also could be my friends now key points and a post estrogen as a main component of pathogenesis of uh, endometrial carcinoma type 1 presence of hyperplasia pre and perimenopausal period not late menopause racial predominance white race invasion late and superficial histologic type is endometrioid stable behavior non-aggressive prognosis relatively favorable now endometrial cancer type 2 estrogen independent 10 to 15 percent of endometrial cancer it affects elder women in late menopause mostly it's more common among of african-american and asian women Etiology is unknown, not associated with unopposed estrogen, it is clear. Risk factor, atrophy of endometrium. Histological variants of type 2 endometrial cancer. Serous carcinoma, clear cells carcinoma. It has, depth, uh, has de de deep depth of invasion into myometrium and uterine tissue this presence of metastasis has rapid growth genetic changes include p53 her2 new serous endometrial cancer typical pathway of type 2 aging late menopause atrophic endometrium genotoxic stress genetic instability formation of carcinoma and rapid uncontrolled growth because of invasive serous carcinoma is typical representative of this type of cancer clinical manifestation is not specific my friends similar to uh, first type of endometrial cancer it abnormal vaginal bleeding but according to the late age of the patient it's a postmenopausal bleeding mostly Vaginal discharge is also possible. Lymphorrhea or purulent discharge. Pyometra may occur in advanced cases of the disease as secondary process because of necrotic tissues are present in the uterine cavity and it is possibility for the development of uh, microbial invasion and uh, local inflammation of uh, the uterus. Of course, it's not sepsis, it's not, of course, it's not septic shock or peritonitis, but local inflammatory process is present and demonstrate the symptoms of pyometra. Pelvic pain or pressure as a result of accumulation of tissues and the fluid in the uterine cavity, my friends, especially if the patients have occlusion of uh, cervical canal, they don't demonstrate purulent discharge or bloody discharge or watery discharge because of there is no way to come this fluid to the vagina. And as a result, they have sometimes chronic pain or even um, cramping pain. Weight loss, dyspareunia are typical for advanced stages of endometrial cancer type 2. Diagnosis is based on gynecological examination. You can find enlargement of your uterus first. By the way, don't forget, my friends, that the patients with endometrial cancer 
type 2 and especially type 1 mostly have uh, such predispositions as uh, uterine fibroma and uh, enlargement of uterus could be due to the previous diseases, fibroma, adenomyosis, for example. Answers ultrasound investigation, uh, it's useful for the detection of invasion into the myometrium. Hysteroscopy and endometrial biopsy are very accurate procedures for the diagnosis. Fractional dilation and the curettage, pap smear, chest x-ray, computer tomography, MRI for the detection of extent of the disease. Staging of endometrial carcinoma. Stage one, FIGO classification uh, includes uh, stage one, 1A tumor is confined to the uterus with less than half myometrial invasion. My friends, I believe you understand that the diagnosis of uh, staging of the process is possible really, a correct uh, staging of the process is possible only after the removal of the uterus. How to detect the depth of invasion? Of course, ultrasound is relatively effective. Uh, computer tomography or MRI also, but finally you will diagnose the depth of invasion only after the section of removed uh, uterine corpus, uh, removed uterus. Stage 1b, tumors is confined to the uterus with more than half myometrial invasion. Stage 2a, and the cervical glandular involvement only. Stage 2b, Tumor involves the uterus and the cervical stroma. Stage 3a, tumor invades serosa or adnexa. Stage 3b, vaginal or para and or parametrial involvement. Stage 3c1, pelvic lymph node involvement. Stage 3c2, periotic lymph node involvement with or without pelvic node involvement. Stage 4a, tumor invades bladder mucosa and or bowel mucosa. Stage 4b, distant metastasis including abdominal metastasis and or inguinal lymph nodes. FIGO definition for grading of the endometrial carcinoma. Grade 1, G1. 5% or less of the tumor shows a solid growth pattern. Grade 2, 6 to 50% of the tumor shows a solid growth pattern. Grade 3. More than 50% of the tumors shows a solid growth patterns. Why it's important? Because of the grade three, grade two tumors don't demonstrate sensitivity for hormonal therapy. And it means that the low differentiation of tumor. At this picture, you see the schematically presentation of stage 1a, b, Stage 2, 3, and 4, endometrial cancer. Treatment includes possibility of surgery, radiation therapy, and hormonal therapy. Transabdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salping gophorectomy and pelvic washing. These can be performed via a transfer, transverse or midline incision. Increasingly, laparoscopic hysterectomy is gaining popularity and is approved. Also, longer-term survival data comparison are lacking. No difference at three years. Pelvic lymphadenectomy is a component of surgical intervention. Role in low-grade early disease is controversial. At this picture, I want to remind you the kinds of hysterectomies. 
partial hysterectomy or supravaginal hysterectomy. Don't speak about supravaginal hysterectomy in patients with endometrial cancer, my friends. It's a possibility of treatment of benign disorders of uterus, typically uterine fibromas. Total hysterectomy, removal of body of uterus and the cervix. And radical hysterectomy, removal of uterine corpus and cervix, upper one third of vagina and the parametriums, my friends. I believe you understand the difference and indications for these kinds of hysterectomy. Adjuvant radiotherapy. Radiotherapy reduces pelvic recurrences, but gave no survival advantage to women with stage 1b endometrial cancer and intermediate risk histology. High dose volt brachytherapy reduces risk of pelvic recurrence. Palliative radiotherapy. External beam radiotherapy given at lower dose and in few fractions to control local symptoms, for example, bleeding. Hormonal treatment. High dose progesterone used for advanced and recurrent disease. Largely aiming for palliation of symptoms bleeding, no survival advantage demonstrated. Treatment of stage one. Total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral selping oophorectomy are the primary operative procedures for carcinoma of endometrium. Postoperative adjuvant therapy should be based on prognostic factors determined by surgical and pathologic staging. Stage two, radical hysterectomy, bilateral selping oophorectomy, and bilateral pelvic lymph adenectomy, or combined radiation and the surgery, external pelvic irradiation and intracavitary radium or cesium follow it in six weeks by total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral selping oophorectomy. Treatment of stages three and four must be based on individual needs. Surgically staged endometrial carcinoma, five years survival by histologic grade and the stage. You see that the highest uh, survival, five years survival, is typical for 1A stage and the grade one. And the rest situation, of course, in stage four and the grade three, only 18% of survival rate. Thank you for your attention, my friends. I finished. See you at Discord platform for the discussion about clinical cases. Is everything clear for you, my friends, in this topic? My friends, please answer. What is unclear for you? Mm -hmm. All right, you write your names and the groups now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sarank, is it clear for you? Is everything clear for you? Questions? Okay, good. Please prepare cases, print them, and we shall discuss them at 12.30. See you at Discord platform, my friends. Goodbye. Thank you for your attention.